medieval on all this. Um, everyone's been talking about phones. I'm going to talk about cars. Um, and it's uh, kind of interesting having sat through the last couple of days listening to so many things that resonate across in the different uh, issues that we're dealing with in the transportation space. But of course, we've got our own special flavors and colors um, on those issues when you start talking about not just your mobile phone, which is, I don't know, in some ways new-ish, but your car, which isn't new at all, but it's starting to do things that you probably never thought about it doing. So let's just start with a simple fact. Um, cars are starting to produce a lot of data. That's a Ford Fusion Energy. It produces 25 gigabytes per hour. That gets you up into the petabits per year pretty quickly, and you can just imagine what happens when the rest of the vehicle fleet starts to get advanced like these new hybrids do. Um, there's suddenly an enormous amount of data rolling around on our streets and highways. Now, a lot of this data is you know, really, really tiny bits of information about how the engine's working and whether the windshield wipers are on and all those kinds of things. Um, but of course, wherever there's a big pile of data, um, there's fun stuff that you can start to do with it. The other thing that we're starting to see out there more and more, cars are connected. How many people in this room have ever driven in a car that has Ford OnStar, or sorry, GM OnStar, Ford Sync, uh, Mercedes-Benz Embrace, uh, Toyota Entune, got some hands? How many people have actually driven in those cars? A handful. For those of you who haven't, go to a dealership, check it out. Um, your car is suddenly capable of connecting uh, to the outside world in some interesting new ways. Um, in some cases, it's because we're embedding uh, communications technology in the car, like this uh, 4G LTE that's coming to us from GM next year, and they're not the only ones. Um, and in other cases, we're simply integrating with the smartphone that you are bringing into the car. Your smartphone and your dashboard can now talk to each other. We can run the apps on the phone, we can run the apps in the car, we can pull the data out of the car through the phone. All kinds of fun new things that we simply could not do just a few years ago. So cars are not only creating a lot of data, but they're connected so we can get the data out in real time, just for fun. Not that we're going to be sending petabits per data even <laughs> over a 4G LTE connection, um, but we can start to send little bits of the right data at the right time to do some very interesting things. Um, and one of the things behind this, um, you know, the first thing that's behind this is consumers want to be connected. Ford put the sync system out there, and it was the first time in the history of selling cars that consumers came onto the car lot and said, I want the car with the sync in it. They didn't even know what car it was. They just wanted the ability to be connected when they were in their vehicles. And we're seeing a very, very strong consumer push on that. But another piece of it is this little number that we have at the top of the screen. That number is actually an enormous improvement over the last 10 years. But we still kill 33,000 people every single year on our roads. I hate that number. Um, and so there's a lot of work going on, as you might expect, to try to stop doing that. Um, and there's two research streams I'll tell you about here. One of them is the connected car. The idea here is that if every car becomes part of the Internet of Things, and every car has embedded communications technology, and every car communicates in a standardized way, then my car can tell your car that we're about to both try to be in the same place at the same time. And we can maybe not do that. I've been in demo cars that do this, um, going through an intersection and someone else blows the red. Your car knew that that guy was about to do that. And you don't end up in the middle of the intersection at the same time. There are lots of other applications like that. But it's really exciting stuff. Now, actually implementing it is, of course, always the fun part. Uh, the picture that you see up there is from the Federal Highway Administration. They are currently running a test of 3,000 vehicles in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that they've stuck these devices in, to see what happens when you put out a whole lot of devices and, and cars like that right now. Um, but the other interesting thing about that is that the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration is going to start considering this year a potential mandate to require those systems because it's a safety solution, much like a seatbelt. Think about it from a lot of different perspectives. That's kind of interesting stuff. Thank you. Um, the other quick thing I'll just touch on, I'm sure you guys have all seen the Google automated car and the concept of automating cars. 
That's another big stream that's going on with this vehicle safety. People have a nasty habit of making big mistakes and crashing into each other. Automation can help that. Um, I do not believe that you are going to be able to walk into a dealership and buy an automated vehicle in the extremely near term, um, but I do believe that we will get there and we are working very hard on it. And in the meantime, we're starting to see a lot of related technologies. Parking assistance, backup assistance, forward collision avoidance, all that kind of good stuff, those are pieces of the automated car. Watch them, they're out there already. So, going a little more quickly, the fun thing about this is little bits of data leave big fingerprints. And the example I'll give you um, is, you know, these are the kinds of questions that we start to ask. How is the car driving? What's going outside, on outside the car? How are you driving? What are you doing while you're supposed to be driving and you're not? Um, the insurance companies have discovered that if they can get just a little bit of data out of the car, they can do a much better job of assessing how risky a driver you are. Anyone seen the ads from Progressive or State Farm or Allstate starting to say, hey guys, put this little dongle in your car, share just a little bit of data with us, and we can better assess your risk as a driver and give you a discount. Well, that sounds good, right? Except that um, one of the other things that I saw at an insurance telematics conference not too long ago was, I can also tell, if I choose to, which of two drivers in a household is driving at any given time, because you have different driving patterns. Statistically, I can do a pretty good job of telling you whether it's a male or female driver. And I can absolutely tell you whether you're driving impaired. So if you're driving drunk, sleepy, whatever, I can tell you that from this kind of data. So then you start to get into an interesting question. Well, it's not personally identifiable data. It's not even data that on its own is interesting at all. But when you start to collect it and put it into some of these different things, you start to have to ask some different kinds of questions. And that gets me to our Here Be Dragon slide. I think we don't know all of what we're up against um, when we really start to talk about connecting all of these things. Going back to a connected vehicle for just a moment, if I have a nationwide network that is standardized and all the vehicles are communicating, what did I just do? I just made my national transportation system hackable. Now, needless to say, people are working extremely hard, and that's why there is a men wearing slide up there, um, to not allow that to happen. I certainly don't want to indicate that anyone's being irresponsible or that people aren't thinking about these issues. They absolutely are. Um, and it's certainly, that kind of solution would be in place well before we mandated anything. So, you know, nobody panic. Um, but you can see the kinds of larger issues that we get into um, and the amount of work that we're going to have to do to figure all this out. Um, the three questions up here I think everyone else has also put up at one point or another. Um, but it's lots of fun. Who owns the data? Does it belong to the car company? Does it belong to you? Does it belong to the insurance company? Does it belong to, I don't know, whoever else gets to touch it? Or is it, heaven forbid, actually owned by the consumer? And do they have rights as to who gets it and where it goes? Um, what can you do with it and who's liable for it? The other piece on liability is both liable for keeping the data safe and then liable for using the data to keep you safe. If I know something about the inside of your car that's a safety problem, am I liable to tell you about it? Or do I just wait and you need to get your car fixed? Um, two quick slides on the end here. One thing that makes it even more fun is the level of integration we're talking about. Don't try to leave all this stuff on the back of that one slide, but we did a little workshop with the Connected Vehicle Trade Association a little bit ago, and um, we asked people to walk through the data chain from source through collection, processing, aggregation, consumption, right? Who's in that data chain? What are they doing at those various different stages with respect to vehicle-specific data? And the thing that blew me away when I started pulling together the results was the data sources are enormous, distributed, and go all over the place. Um, and on the consumption, it's everybody. So you look at this little picture in the middle, every possible combination you can think of between consumer, government, and business, yes, um, I got one slide left, um, is interested in this stuff. And so very last slide, one of the big reasons they're interested, of course, is that the car is the final unconnected frontier. It is rapidly getting connected. And the data is where the dollars are. We're not going to make money selling little widgets and putting them in your car. I mean, OK, we'll make some. But we'll really make money, going back to our friends at Skyhook um, and our friends at Streetlight, um, by figuring out um, how to sift through that data, how to mine it, and how to monetize it. So that's for me. Thanks. <laughs>